Good. Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. My name is Michael Shepard from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, so welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I have an interesting symposium, I think, uh, lined up. Uh, to start this off, obviously we have a few rules and a few uh, sponsors to go through. Uh, but uh, one thing that's going to make this uh, presentation a little, or this symposium a little different, was we're obviously webcasting it. So the rule up here, no taping or recording, well, you don't have to because it's going to be done for you. Uh, and I believe this will soon, very soon be on the uh, PitCon web page. Um, the only exception is the introductory talk, which uh, Aaron LaPointe from U.S. Army and myself will be sharing the, the, the time block for. Uh, I'm going to go through some general concerns that DHS has. Uh, they certainly, a lot of these apply to what Aaron's going to be talking about. Uh, and then Aaron will pick up and share a lot of the DOD concerns. Uh, there are a lot of similarities, a lot of overlap, uh, but there's several distinguishing factors, namely the, uh, the threat itself. So, um, that said, I'll go ahead and uh, start us off with the first talk. Okay, well, I've introduced myself. That's easy enough. Uh, the directorate that I work for at Homeland Security is obviously the Science and Technology Directorate. Uh, my work is purely with explosives, explosives detection. Um, this is a, a headquarters component, so what that really means is that uh, we're in the crosshairs for any of the budget cuts that you hear about. And there's been significant changes at DHS, but one of the things that remains a priority is uh, explosives detection for both aviation and then in mass transit environments, uh, rail and, and, and other venues, uh, related venue. Um, standoff detection is absolutely uh, a priority. DHS over the last couple of years though, we, we've refocused. One of my introductory talks at, uh, I believe it was a PitCon a couple of years ago, uh, one of the distances that I put out was 50 meters. You know, DOD has its uh, requirements sometimes exceeding a couple of hundred meters or even perhaps even further. DHS, we're coming the other way. Uh, rather than extending our standoff detection ranges, uh, depending upon the threats, depending upon the venues that we're going to be looking at, where we're being asked to prioritize, our standoff distances are getting shorter and shorter. So uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, we're working in the zero to 10 meter range. Um, now that sounds much easier and perhaps it will be easier, but uh, it's, still a, it's still a challenge that we have not solved yet. We're making a lot of progress with some of, my, some of our Army colleagues and Navy colleagues, but uh, uh, nonetheless, we don't have a solution out there just yet. But what is the threat? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a two-sided threat for DHS. Uh, and this is one of the things that distinguishes us from uh, our colleagues in DOD. Organized terrorism, everyone knows of Al-Qaeda. There are numerous Al-Qaeda groups. Uh, the one I've shown here is just a, a as an example, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, EQAP. Uh, this is one of the more likely ones that uh, we would expect an attack domestically from. Uh, now there are several others, I'm not discounting those, but this is one of the main ones. Uh, but we also have what we, we refer to as lone wolf terrorism. This is uh, Timothy McVeigh type terrorism where we have um, domestic groups, um, you know, the, the, the uh, I shouldn't say the guy at the post office, but the, uh, the everyday Joe that has some, uh, some problem with some policy or some group or what have you. I think everyone here is quite familiar with uh, the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, it's very much a legitimate threat for us, especially with the availability of commercial explosives and the availability of, uh, well, the internet, homemade explosives. 
So the need for standoff detection. This is uh, we're, we're, this is still a challenge at times to to uh, convey this to Congress. Why do we need to spend so much money to do detection at a distance? Why don't we send canine out? Why don't we send you know a robot with a swab? Uh, you know, are, are there alternatives? And there are alternatives, but we're still pushing standoff detection. And by this, I don't mean remote detection in which you have a person tethered to a piece of equipment that's by the threat. By standoff detection, I mean the, the user and the equipment is at some distance away from the threat. Now, when you get to closer distances, uh, less than a meter, okay, well, we can argue the head back and forth, but uh, certainly at extended distances, non-contact detection is, is what we're going after. Um, obviously, optical techniques, uh, spectroscopic techniques are, uh, are the likely path forward. Um, there's, there's a few other things floating out there, but uh, some biological means. But uh, really and truly, optical techniques uh, appear to be the forefront of what we're doing. Uh, a couple of advantage, advantages of that, um, and I hesitated putting this up here, but elimination of conventional consumables, the tickets and swabs that you go through at airports, the, you know, the pets where they, where, they, where they wipe you down, those tickets, getting rid of those, getting rid of uh, some of the wands and other types of consumables. But anyone in here that's you know operated a gas laser a dye laser or what have you know that there are other consumables that we have to consider um, gas fills uh, windows lens other things that we may have to consider you know certainly we need to build this into the maintenance program uh, optical sampling provides a non-intrusive means um, and by this I mean physical contact with the with the subject and then, is it more efficient? Uh, that's, that's a topic to be discussed. Of course, op the, the, with the wipes, physical contact, those aren't terribly efficient. Um, but then again, the interrogation of this uh, small laser spot size on an uh, entire door panel or what have you, how efficient is that when you need to sample the entire vehicle? Uh, we'll get into more, more into that in just a few moments. Uh, extending the checkpoint, Again, whether we're going to deploy these as in vehicles uh, that we, we drive around and have different targets, or whether this is a checkpoint that we're going to set up and have people coming into a, a, a single door or what have you, well, what we're allowed to do is instead of checking you right before you walk into the door, let's start checking you at some distance so that, uh, you know, if you do get through, you know, if you do get caught with a, an explosive device, well, if you're at the doorway, uh, that's that's a success. You can detonate and cause your damage there. Whereas there might be some response time if we get you at a distance. Real-time screening, uh, wide area surveillance. Um, I think this speaks for itself. If we're going to, in one of the distinguishing factors from DOD to DHS. DOD certainly has a higher probability of, ha reaching, of having an alarm, actually having a terrorist or a suicide bomber that they're going to catch. Um, whereas the domestic scene, uh, occasionally you hear about a, a, an alarm, a true alarm, a suicide bomber that we've caught, or not a suicide bomber, but a, a guy with a gun that we've caught coming through a checkpoint or what have you in the airport. But think of how many thousands of other people have already passed through. So it's really a needle in a haystack that we're going at. We have to be very fast and all inclusive of the people that we screen um, and looking for that small occasional, uh, you know, one one hundredth of a percent versus the general population. It requires real time screening, low false alarms, and the like. Uh, false alarms, again, Spectral selectivity, that's one of the areas we're planning to uh, utilize. Uh, trace sensitivity, we've uh, actually demonstrated it with a couple of techniques that will be presented uh, in a few moments, uh, the ability to reach true trace levels, sub, uh, sub microgram quantities, uh, and even lower um, with optical techniques at distances. Selective detection at distances. 
another possibility for standoff detection, if we don't want to rely upon this to be the ultimate technique or the, the, the one and all technique that's going to determine whether or not you know, we may have to have an officer take a person down or deploy some other response technique, it could be used to trigger additional security. Just like the magnetometers work now, you go through, you beep, you get a pat down, well, let's check you at a distance and then uh, still protect the checkpoint. And of course, mass transit applications, as I mentioned, uh, we're doing a lot more than just aviation security. Um, just a general talk, obviously, this is uh, what we're talking about today is true material identification, not just uh, looking at uh, under for concealed threats, but looking or anomalies, if you will, or areas to, uh, that may warrant suspicion. We're actually trying to identify the materials, and um, well, this is just a nice chart. Anyway. Uh, now, I get a lot of heat from my colleagues for showing these spectra. Where I'm, the intent on this uh, slide is to talk about detection signatures, and I'm probably show, I'm showing probably some of the worst data for. Uh, signatures that one could uh, in terms of explosive detection. Um, you know, these are by coincidence the some of the most plagiarized data. These are the old TerraView company's uh, reflectance terahertz spectra. But um, nonetheless, what I'm getting at, if we can, if we can achieve spectral selectivity, if we can get a true signature to make measurements against. Uh, you know, every, everyone here has the background to understand what that means. Um, but really, what are we going to be detecting? Um, for explosive threats, I'll just jump straight to it. We're probably not going to be going under clothing looking for bulk materials. What we are going to be detecting are the, the thumbprints. You know, someone handles a device, handles some explosive, and then the contamination that results from that. Or the handoff from somebody building it to the other person. So really what we're looking for is a uh, is sloppy chemistry, sloppy analytical techniques. Headspace vapor uh, or, or vapor detection, there are a lot of techniques that are showing promise there, but uh, unfortunately right now this is just not an area that we're interested in uh, because of the limited vapor that uh, one can get from explosives. If we're talking about thumbprint residues, you know, the, the vapor emanating from that thumbprint, you know, we should go for the bulk material, the, in that case the bulk material, the larger amounts. That's a tough enough challenge. I'm going just to move, move ahead here. So when we talk about explosive detections, specifically what do you detect? There are markers, there's tagants, there's other constituents. So when we talk about composition C4, for example, it's not just RDX. It's RDX plus uh, a plasticizer plus, if it's 